Welcome, everyone. My name is Michael Mansfield. I'm the curator of film and media art here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank uh, both the Namjoon Pike Estate and our director, Betsy Brune, for their continuing enthusiasm for our media arts initiative and uh, allowing me to put on little uh, Pike birthday celebrations like this one today. Um, we're here to celebrate Namjoon Pike's birthday. He would have been 82 years old on July 20th. We're a little bit late because I was uh, uh, eager to bring Stephen uh, to talk about his experience with Namjoon Pike, but he was stuck in a residency. Up not, until, not so uh, stuck. Not so stuck. Yeah. He was uh, actively participating in a really fantastic residency that I think I'll tell you about a little bit about shortly. Um, in anticipation of an exhibition that I'm organizing for next year on, on media art, uh, I've been doing a great deal of research into the archives and into Namji Pike's work at Bell Labs in the 1960s. He was an artist in residence from, uh, of sorts from about 66 to 68, uh, working with the computer systems at Bell Labs. And um, uh, I'm finding some really fantastic things in that, in that research. And I thought that it would be interesting to share uh, one small moment. Um, in uh, 1968, 1968, so it's really quite early for computer work. Um, Namju Pike was interviewed by his friend and collaborator, the great Judd Yalkut. And in that interview, he said something that uh, sort of demonstrates his, his, his embrace of technology as an artist medium and as, a, as the, the, that shows really the fantastic potential that technology has for being a, uh, a tool for artists to realize something really, truly unique. Um, and if you bear with me, it's a bit long, but it's really kind of interesting and somewhat funny. It demonstrates his sense of humor. Um, Judd Yalkut asked, his question was, uh, John Gruen has referred to you as the embodiment of the combined generation's compulsion, compulsion to be a latter-day Renaissance man of the arts. At once, being a kinetic sculpture, sculptor, composer, filmmaker, actor, and theoretician. What new roles have you assimilated? Namjoon Pike's response is, this. I am the greatest haiku poet of all periods since 1967. Remember, this was only a year later, so he wasn't making a grand statement just yet. But he says, he goes on to say, scientifically, this is provable. 111 to the 17th power is a magic number. Haiku poems consist of 17 syllables, and there are no more than 111 syllables in the Japanese language. Therefore, 111 to the 17th power is the total possibility of all haiku poems, including the best and the worst. When I let the computer write out all of these possibilities, which is pretty easy, I doubt that, but which is pretty easy, thereafter, no one can write any more haiku poems. Whatever they might write, however they might sweat, the result of this will be my haiku poems. The best haiku poet from now on until the end of time will be the, or the best, sorry, the best haiku poets from now on will be, at best, the editor of my poems. So I think it's kind of a, just an interesting uh, notion on how he thought about technology and the vast potential that it had to uh, contribute to his artistic practice and the practices of, of other media artists. So as you can tell from events like this, um, Nanjun Pike is a, is a really special member of our, both our collection here and he, he's a member of the our, our Smithsonian American Art Museum family. Um, not merely because he, uh, we have significant and important holdings, of which we do have, like Electronic Superhighway and the Namjoon Pike Archive, and Megatron Matrix, and Zen for TV, and a slew of other really important major pieces. Um, his influence is really felt throughout late 20th century art. But perhaps most significantly, his influence his influences are best reflected in the relationships that he had with his own community of artists. And one of those artists uh, we have brought today, Stephen Vitiello. Um, I was really excited to bring Stephen here. I know he has a, he has a uh, quite long personal relationship with Nam June, uh, working him with, with him at Electronic Arts Intermix and, and beyond. Um, and uh, I know that he has some really fantastic things to share with us today. Um, Stephen is a, uh, an electronic musician and a media artist. I've compiled a fairly long bio for Stephen, at risk of embarrassing him a little bit, but um, it does go to show that he has had a remarkable career this, thus far. 
Uh, he's developed sound installations both here and abroad at such venerable institutions as the as Mass Mocha, the Whitney, uh, as well as the 2006 Biennial in Sydney, the Cartier Foundation in Paris, a site-specific project at the High Line in New York City. A true collaborator, Stephen has worked on uh, pieces with artists and musicians including Tony Worstler, Pauline Oliveros, Julie Moretu, Joan Jonas, Raichi Sakamoto, who performed here just uh, two years ago with Stephen. Um, in 2011, he was the subject of an ABC TV Australia documentary, Stephen Vitiello, Listening with Intent. Um, in addition to being a sound artist, he's also worked for Electronic Arts Intermix uh, from 1988 to 2001. Uh, the Kitchen in New York City, a fantastic experimental art space, uh, from 2001 to 2004. He's created various media installations at institutions including the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Museum of Contemporary Art in Lyon, um, he's originally from New York, but he's working now at uh, the, in, in Richmond at the Virginia Commonwealth University where he's attained a position of full professorship. Um, uh, the last thing I want to mention before I bring him up here is that I have photographic evidence that Stephen was also the member of a, uh, a post-punk band called uh, Crazy Sunday with the artist uh, Gregory Crudson. So you, can, you know that he... Uh, He's been around the block a few times, but uh, with, with all of that said, I'd like to introduce Stephen Vitiello. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll sit over here. Okay, thanks. Was anybody here for the, the talks we did in, in April um, last year? There was, there was, I think, were you here? Oh, good. There was, I think there was five presentations, and then later I did a concert with Ryuichi Sakamoto, um, and then Stena Vesolko, one of the greats of all time in video art, also performed. And I was really nervous because John Hanhart, Edith Def Decker, Judd Yalkut, people who are far more academic than I, far more serious, far more prepared with PowerPoint, um, were all speaking. And I, I don't really know how to do those kind of presentations, but I tried. And afterwards, Stena came up to me, and Stena's I think it's part of being Icelandic, but she came up very sternly and she said, I have to say something to you. And I thought, oh crap, what did I do? She said, your talk was very good because you brought Nam June's voice into the space. And I was like, she still looked like it was bad, but it was good. <laughs> and I was totally honored and flattered that she said that. And um, I didn't, I, I had some videotapes, but it's more that when I tell Nam June's stories, I seem to speak in his voice, which you could either think as a terrible impersonation, but it, in, for me, it's, it's absolutely respectful and it's loving and it's, he had this voice that was unlike any other. So when I remember his voice, I hear the words he said in his own, in his language, you know, which was being born in Korea, moved to Japan, moved to Germany, came to America. I had a friend who's Korean American try to help me understand some things once and he's like, well, his Korean isn't very good. And I thought, well, his English isn't very good yet. He's, you know, probably one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, and he just speaks in his own way. And I've told this story a lot, but when I, I worked at Electronic Arts Intermix beginning in 1988, and one day a, an intern came and told me that there was a homeless man trying to steal videotapes. I was like, do you notice the Issey Miyake scarf on that homeless man? He's probably the most important person in the history of video art and he's allowed any tapes he wants. But he would shuffle and his pants were open, you know, open, or like something was always open, his shoes were ripped. <laughs> and, um, and he would speak to me and I, I swear it was like, there was, I think it was Verizon, there was those commercials like, <laughs> and I didn't understand a word he said. He didn't understand a word I said and um, he would shuffle off. And then there was a day in 1989 where he came through and there was a video playing and he said, what's this? And I said, oh, it's um, Peter Callas, an Australian video artist, but it's my music. He said, oh, very good, we go to Blimpies? And he just walked out and I followed him. And suddenly, like, the veil lifted and I could understand him. And he could be understood when he wanted to be. There was, some years later, I went to Korea with him and almost, I, I brought 21 laser discs and I was surrounded by security when I landed in Korea. Big red thing circled for, like, and basically told I was not allowed to leave the country with these, unless I left with these discs. 
And it was the only time in all those years he suddenly knew exactly my name, knew how to spell it, wrote to every political person. And so he, he, he knew when he needed to know and he could be clear when he needed to be clear. But though that voice is, is, um, was a wonderful thing and, and I think he also spoke in a way that you didn't just get one thing. It's like if you watch his videotapes, there's layers, there's abstraction, there's color, there's five things happening at once. Maybe it's very obvious, like, you know, Idaho potatoes, but then there's a whole lot more if you really pay attention. And that's what conversation was like with him. I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna play, I have all these different audio clips. And, and originally I thought I would bring video because that's what you do. And when Michael said I couldn't because of the space, at first I thought, hmm. But then I kind of thought it's wonderful because hearing his voice without his image connects you in a whole different way. So I'm going to play a whole bunch of things. This is a, there's a, a wonderful cassette edition that was published last year. Um, Ray, Ray Gallen, who worked with Nam June uh, through the Canadian broadcast in the late 70s, early 80s, worked on a, a documentary radio piece that now is put out through the record label Touch. And just to hear the first couple minutes, uh, different voices, you'll hear Charlotte Mormon, I think you'll hear John Cage, but for me, when I hear Nam June, I just start tingling. It seems like almost everything that uh, the two of you have done together is funny. I prefer the word wit, <laughs> because I think in terms of funny, like uh, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello are silly. And we don't ever try to be a comedy. That's not our intent. I am grateful that I am writing in a very foreign language, because since it is so inconvenient, I will write down only the necessary things, and I will have no means to disguise my poorness in thinking. I know now the compelled clarité of pre-Socrates thinkers, and I appreciate that I can be one because of my poor English. Namjoon Pike from a letter to John Cage in 1965. I also love to, to be with um, Namjoon, or to receive a letter from him, because it's so entertaining. Uh, more than uh, most people, he, he is surprising. And even though you know he's going to be surprising, he goes on being surprising. <laughs> And that's NYU, I gave a lecture two days ago, they asked uh, how, why my editing style is different from other guys' video editing styles. So I said, as Koreans are Mongolian horseback tribes, so we run differently from, you know, Americans and Caucasians, you know, we run with uh, their Roman chariot, you know. Symphony Number no. 5 by Nam Jun Pike, dedicated to C. Kaspari, the Eternity Cult is the longest disease of mankind. When it is played is just as important as what is played. Okay. So I think a thing about working with for Nam June, I mean, there's a lot of things, but one is that you didn't actually ask him to work for him. If you did, he ignored you, and a lot of people came and said, you know, Mr. Paik, I'm a great editor, and he'd say, oh, thank you very much, and keep walking. Uh, he had to discover people's talents, and I've heard through John Huffman, who still works at the Paik Estate, and others that, you know, people would come in with a piano and he'd say, ah, oh, pretty lady, drop the piano, you're now my computer genius. And people would look, but eventually they would follow. Uh, the first task after I followed him to Blimpy's was he told me to call Mr. Bad Brain and ask him to do concert with him and Mr. Boys. Uh, I knew Mr. Boys, being jo Joseph Boys, was dead. It took me a moment to realize that Mr. Bad Brain was the Bad Brains, the great hardcore band. Uh, how he knew the Bad Brains at that moment was just magical and, and impossible to me. And as I tried to explain to the Bad Brains manager that they'd be on stage with him, he would have a stopwatch, he'd be playing the piano with a hammer, they'd be playing whatever songs they wanted, that every five minutes, wherever they were in the song, they had to stop and he would lead them off stage. He would project images of Joseph Boys and then after five minutes he would bring them back. And I remember explaining this and you could see the kind of like look in the person's eyes of like, hmm, 
But then when they met Pam June, there was immediate, my sense was there was immediate respect and okay, we understand this is somebody special and if he says stop the song, we will stop the song. And then we will smoke a whole lot of pot in the dressing room and then in five minutes we will come back. Um, <laughs> and they did and they, it was at the American Museum of the Moving Images, Image in Queens and the walls vibrated and it was, it was an incredible, incredible concert. But it, it, well, you had to be sort of in his presence and we get that privilege through these works. But for me, the spectacle works were one thing, the performances or the one-on-one -on -one was something else and I, I cherish the one-on-one -on -one and, and also watching others on the one-on-one. -on -one. But I think even though I helped him with concerts, I videotaped events, I told him that I didn't know how to use a camera and he said, oh, good luck. Um, he, the, the thing that made me most valuable to Nam June was that I could find things. And I would see him on the street and he'd say, oh, before I die, you must find my camera three tape. And that's all I'd get. Or before I die, you must find X. And I always found those things. It was kind of legendary that WNET, where he produced a lot of his TV lab kind of masterpieces like Global Groove um, and others had thrown away all of the tapes and or recycled them. And I managed to find, I think, something like 18 two-inch masters and have them snuck out of WNET with the help from a, a colleague friend who worked there. They arrived at Electronic Arts Intermix and he sat on the floor with his legs spread in just glee. And I think anything that ever connected me to him from then on was because I had found that. But I, I loved finding things and making sense of them. And you know, I worked as an archivist at the kitchen and I worked for John Hanhart at the Guggen for the Guggenheim show and it wasn't because I was an archivist in training, it was just I understood what I was finding. Uh, one of the coolest and weirdest things I ever found was I used to go through boxes of Charlotte Mormon's materials and Charlotte, you know, was Pake's longtime collaborator. Uh, it was the state of Frank Pileggi, Charlotte's late husband. Uh, Barbara Moore would let me in, take a few things at a time, transfer them, bring them back. And I found this cassette once that said, Charlotte, Thanksgiving, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, John Cage, Nam June, others. And I was like, what is this dream concert? Uh, if you've never heard this, it's on Ubu, where uh, I sent a lot of Charlotte's stuff and some Nam June's things. But I made this little edit, and it's, so this is her answering machine. I believe it's 1972. Uh, I, I edited out a lot of people, but it's kind of like this magical mystery of where is Charlotte? Because it was Thanksgiving, she wasn't showing up at the gallery, she wasn't showing up at her mother's house in Little Rock, Arkansas. But again, for me, hearing this and not seeing it is kind of like bringing some part of the past into the present. I hope, I hope it works for you guys. This is, it's about, well, I made a five minute edit, but I'll probably cut it short. This is John on behalf of John and Yoko. I wondered if you'd seen the village voice. Page 30, Yoko's ad. Also, uh, the review on uh, whatever page it is doesn't seem to mention about the maze. Do you think it's a plan? I think they're a pair of bastards, whoever it was. And also, page 31. But we don't care about that because on page 30... Hi, this is John Cage, Charlotte. My number is 989-7132. I'm very sorry that I wasn't um, present at the um, festival that you had recently, and I want to explain to you why I was. I don't know if you catch it. Charlotte ran the annual avant-garde festival of New York. So some of the answering machine messages were people either commenting on being in the festival or not being in the festival. If you ever get to see the documentary, topless cellist Charlotte Mormon, uh, Yoko Ono says that she feels like Charlotte's greatest artwork was the festival and it was this great environment that she created for years for artists to perform avant-garde works in Shea Stadium and Grand Central Station at the South Street Seaport. Uh, and in that moment, John Cage is apologizing, it sounds like, for missing the festival. This is 
year ago. I just called to say hello to you and also there's some message. Maybe you should call me when you come back. Bye-bye. And Sarah said, please tomorrow bring TV bra. Okay, we have to put, try to put TV bra to, don't forget. And try to be in the morning. Okay. Get out of it to open and can. Bye bye. If you need translation, tell me. Sarah, today, please come before 10. By 10 o'clock and bring one the high spring, you know, thin high spring to make high sound and plus heavy blood. Don't be late because today there will be John Kennedy, so you have to be there at 10 o'clock. Today is John Kennedy day, okay? Don't be late. It's, I, at first I thought he was saying John Kennedy, but I, I have to imagine it was John Kennedy who was within the family, but um, if anybody knows why he would have been, maybe she was a collector. The, the, it goes on and on as Nam June's at the Bonino Gallery where he had his first major New York exhibition, solo exhibitions, and um, there they're, he's, they're way with Joan Kennedy. Next he's with Pierre Schaefer, the father of music concrete. And also I have to say that in some Cajun way, I kind of love the quality of this and the, and the silences and the beeps and the answering of the audio. So, 10 a.m., this, don't forget about 10 a.m. Bye-bye, 10 a.m. Uh, I met yesterday Pierre Schaeffer of French television. He's number one man in French television and the father of music concrete, Pierre Schaeffer. And he and his assistant is coming 11, 11 o'clock today. Okay, 11 o'clock, uh, Pierre Sheffer's of card is coming. He's a very, very important guy. Bye-bye. You, you have to leave, come before that. Okay, there's, there's a lot more. Um, there is... I just look for this one. Sorry. So, in contrast... I found this one, which actually makes me sad, but again, it, it's, it's, this, this is almost a minute long. It's not looped or anything like that, but this was a message Nam June left for me. Out, you know, he had a stroke in 1996 and never really was the same. Uh, when he came out of the I was sitting on the floor. He was in the hospital. I remember I visited him, and he was asleep, and he woke up. He said, oh, Mr. Vicello, we start a TV station. And at the time, and I, you know, it was one of those moments you're like, is he alive? Is he dead? But he was always thinking. And in, in that instance, in what looked like a coma, he was planning this MTV of classical music and sexy ladies. But um, anyway, after he got out of the hospital, he needed me to come get a videotape from him and hide it in my house. And this was the answering machine message. Desperately looking for Mr. Vitello. 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 Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Desperately looking for Mr. Vitello. 26 a.m. Wednesday. Okay. So, I don't know if it's, if it's ev evident to you, it's definitely his voice after, um, after illness, he's a little bit more drained. But again, even in illness, he was always, I mean, you go over to his house, he was paralyzed on one side, he was always drawing, he was watching TV, he was thinking, on several different levels, and there was always assignments um, to do. There was always projects. There was always a future. He really, and I, I think I've talked to, to Michael and um, John Hanhart about this, but one of his great hopes was to do one of his satellite broadcasts in, for John Cage's Centennial in 2012, and 
that was something he was looking forward to. He was always, you know, always looking forward, and, and even if his health was sort of fading, beating him down. One of, one of the things that I used to do is go over to his, his loft, and he'd take these big pieces of drawing paper, and he'd write letters to people, and then he'd have me transcribe them. I had some of them I donated. I think I, I, think I donated a couple to the Smithsonian, but um, they were like, you know, a letter that really was maybe two paragraphs, but that would take up seven pages of giant, beautiful arches drawing paper. And sometimes I couldn't understand his handwriting, or this one time I went over there and I just, um, he, was, he was writing a text, it was right after David Tudor died. And hopefully most of you know that Tudor was Cage's longtime collaborator, brilliant, brilliant musician, and truly one of my heroes. Um, but Nam June wrote this beautiful essay for a zine, a zine called Music, and I thought I should have him record it so that I could not only have the handwriting, but go back and listen. And here you really hear him tired, but, uh, but again, it's, it's him in spirit. He's a very they're talking about David Tudor had this piano that was in Stony Point, New York, that was in a space that was so humid that mushrooms were growing out of it. Um, <laughs> Sorry. I'll start again. In a she wrote many marijuana masters artworks, which paid for performances by me or with me, performance by me or to the arcade or the museum. But Maria Verde took pictures at the marijuana concert. One of those things I do know inspired me to write and dedicate a few books like this. Each had swept such for a public that the professor predicate did not Okay, it might be too hard for you to understand, but all the, in, in, at the end of this text, he says that uh, that I should that basically I should buy Tudor's piano, but that he has to. And then I told him he had to give me a raise before I could possibly afford it. Money with Nam June was sort of abstract, but it was it was kind of a karmic thing, so, same as credits. For years, he would promise me drawings. He would, I would see him, he'd say, oh, you do this for me, I'll give you a drawing. And I'd see all these people rolling their eyes and go, you will never get those drawings. And then, like, 10 years later, when my daughter was born, every time I came over, I would leave with an armful of drawings. A lot of them say, like, Vichiello Baby on them, or um, they would, or remember UPS, meaning, like, ship the tapes, but then there would be a drawing. <laughs> um, there's a great story that he, David Bowie was in Wrap Around the World, which was a third of the big satellite broadcasts, and he promised him a painting. And I guess, you know, Bowie also felt like after a while he would never get that painting. And many, many years later, Nam Jun found Bowie's studio address and delivered something like five paintings. So there was, there was ways that you got these things, and I trusted that and believed it. And I would see occasionally others be bitter or be like, oh, you know, forget it. But I, I knew things worked out. He called me once from the Venice Biennial and said, oh, so sorry, you worked so hard, we forgot your name in the credits. I was like, okay. But then I got to the Guggenheim, and if you looked at that big laser piece that Norman Ballard was so central to, it also said I was a primary collaborator, but I did nothing on that. Um, but he owed me, <laughs> he owed me a credit. So, <laughs> Thing, things just worked out, and, and, and you know, he once he told me once that I had a karmic debt to the World Trade Center because those are the sound recordings that I'm most well known for. And 
I've certainly got a karmic debt to Nam June. Uh, when one of the last things that I did with him was well, going back to the Guggenheim exhibition, for years I've been looking for his audio recordings. And I knew that in the late 50s, early 60s, he produced a, a number of audio tapes. He used to do these performances where he'd have two or three reel-to-reel -reel decks on stage. He'd be playing multiple tape decks. He'd jump off the stage. He'd attack the audience. Uh, people were afraid he'd jump out the window. He would turn on the exhaust of a motorcycle, leave, and eventually call to say the concert was over. And whenever I asked about the audio, he'd say, oh, it's too boring, it's lost, it's fluxus, nobody cares. And there was a day that he came out in his wheelchair and he said, oh, you now I've discovered all of my um, audio tape masterpieces. And he gave me this box spilling with reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes, broken, mislabeled, I mean, labeled HJC, question mark, simple. Um, I didn't know what speed they were. I didn't know what forward, backwards they were. They were filthy. It was raining. He told me just to leave. It was OK. And I said, I need an umbrella. And he said, no. And I, I, I was walking. I, no exaggeration. I had tears in my eyes on Broadway. <laughs> but um, we, we, I worked with Art Schifrin, who's a fantastic audio restoration specialist. You'll hear his voice in a minute. Uh, and made them listenable, and they were then played at the Guggenheim and some future exhibitions. And Sub Rosa, a record label that does a lot of electronic music, but also some interesting historic releases, asked me several times if they could put out a CD of that material, and I'd ask Nam June, and he'd say, mm -hmm. and finally, and it's the only thing I probably had ever nagged him about, but it was like the third time, fourth time, I was like, are you sure? He said, okay, but you oversee everything. And I didn't see him or speak to him for the last two years of his life. And I really, like, if I had any guilt, I felt guilty that I had maybe pushed that. And then I was giving a talk, and John Huffman, who had worked with Nam June, said, do you know about that CD? And I was just like, oh, shit, what? And he said, he listened to that over and over, and he would play it as loud as possible and laugh tears. And, um, it was probably the most proud and sort of special thing because I just, I really thought maybe I had gone too far. That was the one thing where, because audio was so special to me. But these were recordings, they were fairly abrasive, uh, like his work. They were very fast, there was appropriation. He told me in his apartment in Germany he would scream as loud as he could over and over and over until his landlady would bang on the walls. Anyway, knowing that he listened to these in the last days of his life made me really proud. So this is, this is just a little bit of, um, you actually hear the, the preservation person doing a little tag at the beginning and then you'll hear some of the audio. Wait, oh, that's not what I thought it was. Maybe you won't. All right, you're not gonna hear the, the preservation person, it's just the track. There's a whole lot more, and there is, there's a commercial CD, it's called Nam June Paik Works, I think it's 1959 to 81 or something like this on Sub Rosa that you can still get or you can get it on iTunes, and all the tracks are there. But it just plays into the last little story I'm going to tell, an audio clip I'm going to play, and then I'll, maybe if there's questions or maybe we just go have cookies. Um, I think it was 
Two and a half years ago, Ryoichi Sakamoto contacted me and asked me to do a concert with him. And hope some of you, maybe all of you know, Sakamoto's kind of a rock star. He's probably, as far as I know, the most well-known contemporary Asian musician in Asia, and he's an, as an Asian and Asian American musician. Just um, he's done he won an Academy Award um, soundtrack. He's collaborated with younger musicians. He's collaborated with some of the masters of jazz, of classical music, and of pop. Um, he was in Yellow Magic Orchestra. So I, I got the call. Sakamoto was doing a week of duets at the Stone in New York City. And I was crazy nervous. I was almost like dying nervous until the moment I met him. And then I got to the sound check and shook his hand. And I felt, wow, this is going to be fantastic. I like this. you know. And, there was just a kindness about Sakamoto, but also a quiet. And we started to talk, and I said, you know, I don't know if you knew I worked with Namjoon Paik, and I know you also worked with Paik. And he said, oh, no, I didn't know. I said, you know, Paik really admired you. And I saw a man who I don't think ever blushes blush. And he said, when, as a young man in Asia, in, in Japan, there was really two faces that he could look to as sort of as heroes. One was Yoko Ono, the other was Paik. And in the concert we were playing, and I was playing guitar, field recordings, electronics, Sakamoto was playing uh, piano and, and had some tapes, and he suddenly snuck in elements of that last track that I just played you. I thought this was going to be a live CD on, on 12K, the label I work with, but I think it's not going to be, so this will probably never be published, so at least I can share it with you. So. Um, Again, this is live at the Stone. It's just an excerpt of our concert, but it's it's sort of in a way we're paying homage, or he was paying homage to Pate through this moment, which was, I think, quite sweet, but also kind of a little bit chaotic. <laughs>
This is Participation TV. Please follow instruction. Close your eyes. Open your eyes. more but um, hopefully that's okay for the moment so I don't I don't know how it goes at birthday lectures but <laughs> um, if you have any questions or, or anything that I can answer I brought more but I, I don't want to I don't want to test your your energy or time I think I think uh, we would be happy to take a couple questions if anybody has any questions um, or we can uh, we can all head downstairs and you're welcome to uh, Talk to us in the uh, in the courtyard. Sounds good. Okay. But thank you all very much for coming. I look forward to seeing you in the galleries here next week. Please give a big hand to Stephen Vitello. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Yeah, my pleasure.